Hey, welcome back to The Urban Monk. Dr. Pedram Shojai here in Southern California, uh, enjoying some time with the family, enjoying some time kind of decelerating. Movie's almost done, uh, third book is done, so I'm starting to reap the harvest from a long year. Uh, and uh, it's been a good year if you're a skier. It's been an amazing year. Uh, and uh, I got up only twice this year because of all the, uh, the eggs I've been sitting on trying to hatch. Uh, and I miss it, I miss it a lot. It's my drug of choice and uh, my guest today today uh, was considered the best female for 12 years, best female in the world for 12 years, professional extreme skier. Kristen Ulmer, uh, she's been retired for 15 years and she could probably still kick anyone's ass um, <laughs> and lives in Salt Lake City so you know she's not too far from it. And we're gonna be talking about fear and the art of fear. Uh, she's been facilitating a lot of uh, talks on the subject and for me, you know, Skiing is controlled falling, so you're dealing with fear from, from jump and uh, understanding how to manage and contain that and be in your own element is a big deal. And it's part of our Urban Monk shtick, so let's get into it. Hi, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me on. Yeah, so uh, so we share a drug of choice. I love, love, love <laughs> skiing. It's it's one of my favorite things to do. And um, you sounds like, you know, getting to where you were at you were probably doing it from a very young age, I would assume. How'd you get into it? I got into it because I could get out of school on Wednesdays early if I was in the ski program. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't really get addicted to skiing until I was a teenager, and then I would skip school um, f during lunch break every day to go skiing at the local mountain, and then they, the the new principal figured out about two months before my graduation and um, basically sus suspended me for um, a little bit of time and um, I didn't think I was going to be able to graduate but I think they wanted to get rid of me so I graduated. <laughs> so they passed you through anyways. And then, yeah. and then so the arc there is okay so the it, it bites and now you're like super into skiing and you become a professional like do you do like just give, give me a little bit about your career path there. I went from being a okay skier to being a world-class skier in two different sports in about three years time. I was skiing in jeans until I was 20 years old and then within three years uh, I was on the US ski team for moguls and then I was considered the best woman big mountain extreme skier in the world and I never had any kind of coaching whatsoever except for a couple lessons in elementary school. Um, I'm kind of an anomaly. I'm definitely the poster child for it's all mental. Wow. So what happened? Like what clicked if you could kind of go back to those like, you know, um, jeans days? Like how did that girl become this girl? Like what happened? Seems how this is about fear. Why don't I just focus on that and just say I had the right relationship with fear. Um, I was addicted to fear. Like I really enjoyed feeling it. And people say, oh, they're adrenaline addicts. Um, I actually am willing to admit that what that is is I was a fear addict. A fear addict. Mm -hmm. Okay, so as you are facing fear, something happens inside of you that does what? I have an equation. Fear plus breathing equals excitement. I don't feel fear, I just feel excited. And in many ways, I, I didn't feel like I felt any fear. And I was called fearless during my ski career, um, but really all I felt was excitement and passion and um, just addiction and a desire to express myself. And, you know, you ask what makes a, a great athlete. Well, it's the perfect uh, storm of a lot of things. And f you're having the right relationship with fear is one of them. So you have an addiction to fear, which some would say is not the right relationship with fear, but uh, for you it worked out. Um, and so you have this addiction to fear and then you added breathing. Is this conscious breathing or is this just something you figured out on your own? Well, we're getting way ahead of ourselves because remember when I became a professional skier, I was in my early 20s and I was kind of a moron. I didn't know that any of this was going on. All I knew is that I love skiing. I loved expressing myself. I love the attention and I just found the right um, sport, the right way to live my life and I was getting a lot of attention for it and I just got better and better and better and uh, I was the best in the world at my sport for 12 years. It was kind of a long reign of terror. So you're doing this, you're good at it, you don't know why and then you decode it later to be able to translate that because now you teach about fear and so you wrote a book about fear. So at what point did you kind of understand what was happening in the secret sauce inside your own head or, or emotions to make this transition? Well, here's where it gets interesting. 
because I felt fearless. I was voted um, by the outdoor industry to be the most fearless woman athlete in all sports disciplines, not just skiing. And I really felt fearless. But what happened is over time, things started to happen in my life that didn't make any sense. Like I had PTSD, which is a fear injury, because I had a lot of friends die. I had a lot of near-death experiences, that sort of thing. Um, I started to burn out, you know, and here was this thing that I just loved to do. What, what the heck was that all about? And I started to hate skiing even, and hate is a very strong word. And uh, I mean, I, I would dread ski season when it would come around. And I had adrenal failure. I had completely flat cortisol levels. And so after 15 years in the business, I, I just really didn't want to do it anymore. I was kind of traumatized by the whole experience and I didn't know what that was all about. And this is where I started to realize that I was doing the same thing that everybody does about fear and you know the language that I was conquering it, I was overcoming it, I was pushing it out of my mind, um, I was rationalizing it away and I was really, really good at it, better than most. And uh, that war against fear was being carried out in my unconscious mind and it was messing up my life, life in ways that I couldn't see. And usually somebody can get away with repressing fear like that for about 10 years and then things go south and they go south fast. So what are the first telltale signs that this is happening in your unconscious mind and that there's some battle that's happening just below the radar of your awareness that's starting to kind of reflect into your life? I just explained some of the ways in which repressed fear showed up in my life. And you know, you think you're fearless and you're really not. Um, I actually was motivated by fear quite a bit, but maybe we'll get that to that later, maybe we won't. But for other people, you know, maybe if you repress fear, it'll show up in one of two ways. Either it'll show up as obvious, rampant, excessive fear, anxiety, stress, angst, nerves, whatever you wanna call it, or it won't be, fear it won't show up as fear itself it'll show up in some uh, kind of twisted covert way like anger or uh, not getting along with your kids or insomnia or depression is a big one too whenever you're declaring a war on the, a huge part of your life you know fear of course being such a huge part of who you are and that war is being carried out in your unconscious mind it's going to sap your resources it's going to just mess up your life in ways that you can't see, uh, you know, make no mistake. It's, you, you haven't gotten rid of fear. Elvis has not left the building. Like mm -hmm. it is still there, but now it's operating covertly in weird ways. Yeah, it's wearing a different mask. It's playing a different role and it's, um, exactly. it's, it's rattling around somewhere. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. So, okay, most people teach uh, what to do about fear in what way? Like, so, you know, the conventional wisdom about like how to deal with fear is what? I find that there's two approaches to what people teach about fear, and then I'm kind of a standalone. The first way is, like I said, you know the language, they try to conquer, overcome it, let it go, rationalize it away is the big one, right? Um, like emotional intelligence is your ability to understand your emotions and not let them control your life. Um, that is what most people teach. There are a few slightly more progressive teachers that say, okay, but fear is natural, you must allow yourself to feel it, but then they can't help themselves. They then finish by saying, okay, now that that's clear, you know, it's false evidence appearing real, we got to get rid of it, right? Take three deep breaths, breathe out your fear. And so pretty much everyone on the planet teaches some form of dissociation or not dealing with fear or fighting or running away from the fear, where I do the exact opposite, um, which is say, hey, turn to your fear, give it some attention, and then it'll leave you alone. It's kind of like a, a child that's whining, like if you turn to your whining child and give it the child some attention, then the child will calm right down sure. and go away. At least you hope so. <laughs> right, right. It doesn't, it doesn't work in my house, but yes, I've, 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 I've heard that theory. <laughs> um, okay, okay, but so we're talking about almost like a reparenting theory of emotions for fear and turning around, leaning into it and embracing it and being like, okay, what is this? What do you want? And so like as an extreme skier, you're standing on a freaking cliff. And so there's this kind of biological thing, which is like, yo, don't jump down that. That's dumb. Right. But that's a real extreme example. 
right? Which is like, hey, you might fall to your death. Uh, we have this, uh, you know, with public speaking, which is kind of, uh, you know, the obvious one that everyone's, you know, kind of the number one fear. Um, so what is your methodology? Like, how, how, does, how does your system do this differently? Let's just say for public speaking. Like, you know, I'm getting the pitter-patters and, you know, they're calling my name. Now I'm starting to get clammy and oh shit, right? Right. And your body doesn't know the difference between standing on the edge of a cliff or about to give a speech, right? You know, we have this amygdala, this lizard brain, like, oh my gosh, it, it feels like a near-death experience. I'm getting up in front of all these people. And so I used to do it wrong. You know, let's just be clear about that. And I, I have spent the last 15 years healing my relationship with fear. And then, of course, writing this book, working with clients to help them heal their relationship with fear. And what I do now, because the first speech I ever gave, I froze up there. You know, I was there to speak about being fearless. And I thought, well, I'll just speak from the heart. Like, clearly, I know something about fear. And I got up there and I'm, I'm like, I have no idea what I feel about fear. But what I do now is that, you know, in, in advance of the speech, I'll use fear as a way to get my butt off the couch like you've got to prepare for this like fear is just this discomfort like impelling you uh, compelling you to move and go and do some work and and be prepared and so leading up to the speech that's how fear can be of use and then when you're about to give the speech i always like to be just a little bit underprepared so that i have just a little bit of fear in my system so that when i actually give the speech i'm more sharp i'm more focused i'm more in the present moment i'm more alive um, I would say that probably 4% fear, like if this is your comfort zone, you know, just kind of a little bit out of your comfort zone, that's when you're going to find an optimal flow state um, for giving a great speech or being a great athlete for that matter. 4%, that's the number? Mm-hmm. So some people lose it, obviously, right? They, they clam up, they, they have almost like a panic attack and they, and they mm -hmm. start to really, you know, they start to breathe it away, you know, all the stuff, you know, tapping, whatever the hell they're, they're trying to do to, to, to make it go away. Um, at, you know, what I'm hearing here is, you know, this started when you agreed to the speech several months ago and so now maybe it's a, a lack of preparedness, maybe it's this, maybe it's that, so there's this whole arc of kind of filling in that that um, that space before the fear seizes you, so that that fear number could kind of hang out around four uh, percent. You don't just do this like for tomorrow's speech. You do, you prepare for it. You get ready. Am I, am I hearing that right? Like you you want to really build out your ability to perform and deliver, um, and use that fear to drive your excellence. In a perfect world, but I would say that. 99.99% of all of us do not deal with fear when they're giving a speech in that way. Most people, everybody for that matter, um, has been so programmed to just block it out that, you know, let's dissect what a panic attack is, you know, whether it's in a speech or just people that are having panic attacks. Well, it's undealt with fear kind of building up in your system, like filling up a balloon until eventually it just explodes into your system all at once. So whenever you're not dealing with your fear, you're going to then um, start to feel panic, anxiety, like people that feel kind of excessive, low grade, or even high grade sense of anxiety or stress in their lives all the time. You know, what do they do? Well, they take the three deep breaths, they meditate, they, you know, do the tapping, they buy little gizmos and take courses on how to block the fear out. Well, it gives you temporary relief, like it can help you get through a moment, but you have just kind of started a, a madness practice of like, okay, where did that fear go? It, it didn't go out into the atmosphere, mm. you know, it just got shoved down into your body and stored in your system. And now it's like operating from the basement, you know, in a covert way, just like, like imagine if you um, abused your child and locked your child in the basement, you know, it's now down there screaming, yelling, you know, ba banging chains, just setting the house on fire in order to get out anytime your guard is dropped. And I'll tell you what, when you're about to go give a speech, your guard is dropped. Yeah. Or, you know, it, it'll come out when you're trying to sleep at night, you know, or the night before the speech. It's, 
you really, really don't want to repress fear. And it just drives me crazy that everybody teaches tips on how to do that. Yeah. Well, you know, sedatives in general aren't ultimately transformative. <laughs> yes. Right. You can always medicate the fear away and put right. it like, you know, t a 10 feet below cement underneath the basement. <laughs> right, right. But the, the, the skeletons are still down there and they will be found. Yeah. And that's really kind of, uh, you know, humanity 101. I mean, that's, that's where we're at, right? We're in this infantile yeah. stage of you know, repression of emotions, any emotion, and fear being, you know, the most primal one, one would argue, right? So you had this one relationship with fear where you loved fear and you fed off fear and it fueled your, you know, your crazy, you know, escapades. What do you like about fear now? Like this new, this new retired, less, you know, less likely to jump off a cliff person? How do you use fear in your life? Well, imagine Bambi. You know, Bambi's, I, I kind of look at animals for um, great inspiration. And of course, we're a lot more complicated than animals. We have these incredibly big brains, and maybe I'll get to that later. But Bambi is eating grass in a field somewhere. And all of a sudden, oh my gosh, there's some rustling in the bushes, and lizard brains has a shot of fear to the body. And all of a sudden, Bambi comes alive with fear. Like Bambi plus fear equals better hearing, better eyesight, and she's scanning the bushes, and oh my gosh, there's a, there's a lion, right? So she takes off running, and she runs faster than she ever has, because Bambi plus fear equals super, super, super Bambi, right? And then, um, of course, Bambi survives in my story, and then she's back eating grass in a field somewhere, and it's like, 10 minutes later, she's, she doesn't have PTSD, she doesn't have to go see a shrink, she doesn't have to do tapping, you know, she's not paranoid that oh my gosh is there going to be another tiger or why does this always happen to me it's like she's she's just fine again and so that's kind of what I'm going for with fear in my life and because I've never had a relationship with fear like this before it's definitely a work in progress but you know using it to help me come alive and, and I talked earlier about how um, fear was a motivator in skiing like I was entirely motivated during my ski career of fear of failure, fear of being invisible, fear of not being loved. Um, and I'll tell you what, you jump off a 70 foot cliff and people love you and you are no longer invisible. And um, I didn't realize the incredible resource that fear is as a motivator. Like I understand Bill Gates is entirely motivated by fear of failure. Um, and look what he's accomplished in his life where other people are crippled by fear of failure. Like what's the difference? Well, it's the difference is the relationship that you have with fear. Are you using it as a tool for motivation, creativity, and aliveness? Or are you repressing it and is it becoming then your repressor? Or are you controlling it and therefore it's now controlling you? It's interesting as you look at basic polarity and you can either move towards something or repel it and move away. And, mm -hmm. you know, we've created this, this island, um, you know, around fear and kind of moved further and further away. And so what you talk about in your book is kind of the correct language, the, the ability to kind of reassimilate our relationship with it. So some of the terms you use is becoming intimate with fear, being curious about fear, doing a dance with fear, making friends with fear. That is not part of the kind of traditional <laughs> yeah. lexicon of conquering, over coming, confronting. It's very, um, you know, it, it's very overwhelming. It's like, it's kind of, it's kind of like what the, the uh, early Aryan tribes did to the, 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 the female worshiping uh, tribes when they took over, right? They just annihilated and said our way, our, our way or the highway. Like this emotion has to get out of the way. I've got a plan. I've got an agenda. And it's, it's, it's exactly how our uh, ecology has run. There's so many things that, that parallel how our world works and how we deal with emotions and fear being one of the most powerful emotions we have. So you used to tap into it in one way. There's actually a piece to this with Bambi that happens kind of physiologically, which is interesting, is once Bambi knows she's safe, there's this physiological tremor where they like the animal shakes and shakes and all of the adrenaline and the cortisol just kind of releases and then they just like usually take a dump and go back to eating grass <laughs> right right and and then they're chilling again right and so for us mm -hmm. it's like that 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 just kind of reverbs in our body and we just hold on to it and it becomes part of our personality and we're just an anxious person because we never get that opportunity to release it so 
what are good ways in your opinion to not just embrace the fear but feel it and lean into it and just kind of go, go through the whole wave like ride that whole wave to shore so that you don't have those unresolved emotions kind of haunting you so commenting on um bambi shaking it off like i've seen that in ducks a lot and i that's why i laughed um, well, shoot, there's so many things I could say right now. Let's just, first of all, identify the problem and then I'll offer the solution. So I gave the analogy of like fear being like a child. So imagine that you have a house full of children and in Zen tradition, uh, we have like 10,000 different states of being, fear being just one of them. But of course it gets a lot of, um, play because people just don't know what to do with it. So mm -hmm. picture this, there's two different ways to live your life. And the first way is what most people teach about fear. So 10,000 children, half your children you've named, let's say happiness, joy, forgiveness, gratitude, love. And then the other half of your children you've named fear, anger, sadness, despair, misery. Despite your best intentions, would you be able to treat all your children the same way? The semantics have doomed it. <laughs> right, exactly. Yep. And so because we're so judgmental, and animals are not so judgmental, they don't have those big brains, you know, compartmentalizing things is good or bad, they just are. So what we tend to do is that we tend to love and nurture and show off to the world these children over here. And what do we do with these children over here? Hide them in the closet. <laughs> Right. I say put them in the basement, like mm -hmm. duct tape over their mouths, put them in the basement, lock the door, throw away the key. And then we nurture these. We have a gratitude practice, a forgiveness practice, all that. And look at how lovely of a person I am. And then all these are down in the basement. And every time they kind of rear their ugly heads, we learn coping mechanisms on how to deal with them, medicate them away, drink another glass of alcohol, whatever. So what's happening in the basement? <laughs> They're burning the house down. I mean, how would you feel if you were a child that had been put in the basement with no food, no water, no love, no sunshine, no toilet, no toilet paper? Like, what would you do? I'd show up and fuck you up next time you were trying to give a speech. <laughs> right, exactly. And so what my book seeks, seeks to do is the second possible way of living your life is taking these children out of the basement. And keep in mind, fear is kind of the ringleader of all, like, let's say you put jealousy in the basement and you put unworthiness in the basement. It's like fear is kind of the ringleader to all of them, like anger in the basement. You know, 95% of what we know is modern angler, anger is just uh, repressed fear coming mm. out. So... Um, what we do, what I do, what I teach and is taking these children out of the basement and seeing all that life has to offer us, the wisdom of all of these voices as well, and the creativity there and the aliveness that's found, and live your life from what I call whole mind potential that includes fear. And um, so the, how do you do that, though, you know, especially if you've spent your whole life just squashing anything mm. negative? You know, that's kind of the question. Um, in the book, of course, I have a whole series of chapters about that. Like the whole second half of the book is about that. But basically it starts with, first of all, just identifying or seeing what your relationship with fear is. And so maybe we can do that right now. Like, tell me, what do you think your relationship is with fear based on everything I've described? I have a similar history as your own. My, my, my last name, Shojai, actually translates into brave one. And, you know, I've got a lot of scar tissue to show for it. Like, I, you know, <laughs> I've, you know I've, I've jumped off many of things and I've been in the martial You're arts. You're my kind of person. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. We, we share a similar kind of crazy, right? <laughs> and, and so that's, that's what fueled me for a long time, right? And, and so, you know, then you start to go, wow, my hip hurts. And, you know, wow, this, this thing isn't getting better, you know? And so, so you get into that. And so for me, it really became about that. But it also became about... Um, being okay with letting go of the storefront of the person who had uh, systematically repressed the other, you know, the basement, if you will, in your, in, your, in your language for all those years, right? And so, you know, I've had decades of Buddhist and Taoist training and I've gotten my, you know, my, my, um, myself into lots of situations where I've been, um, you know, put in my place by people who are like, yo, that's ego, yo, that's fear, we're facing it now. Um, and it's still there. I mean, I'm, I'm still, I'm driven by the fear of failure um, and I have to catch myself. Um, you know, I got a lot of that Bill Gates thing going on. <laughs> 
Well, it's, it can be very useful. Mm -hmm. So it sounds to me like you are similar to me and that you have a paradox going. It's like you have, on the one hand, like you enjoy feeling fear, you like taking risks, you like stepping out of your comfort zone, you know, fear of failure drives you, like maybe you have a healthy relationship with your fear of failure. Um, so that's the one, you know, that's on the one hand. But on the other hand, you also, you didn't talk about this so much, but I can see just how much you're in your head around fear, like just talking about it. You know, when, when I start talking about fear, people immediately want to know, well, what do you mean by fear? You know, people think of fears or they think of it as being some sort of story or um, programming in their head. Fear is really simple. Like you look at a kitten, you smile, all right? That's joy. You walk to the edge of a cliff or you get in front of a, a group of people, you're going to give a speech and if you feel fear, right? It's just a sensation of discomfort in your body. But then we start talking about it and thinking about it. And so like I asked a question, what is your relationship with fear? And you know, we start to talk and it's like, imagine if I was a shrink and you would talk about your relationship with fear for an hour, like, would that ever really resolve anything? Would that ever really give you the opportunity to just feel the fear in your body? Probably not. So what I had uh, in my ski career is that I both loved it and hated it to an extreme at the same time. And when you make your life all about one thing, then you can both love and hate it at the same time. Mm. Like if you make your life all about your marriage, like you can both love and hate your husband at the same time, right? Your job, you know, your child, everything. So uh, what you have then is a paradox. Um, so on the one hand, you have some healthy uh, rela uh, relationship kind of motives and, and, and operandi with fear. But on the other hand, is there room for improvement is my next question. 100%. 100%. Right. Yeah. It's it's always there. And so, you know, for for me, it's the same thing that I have had with, you know, countless people that I've worked with over the years, which is when the hell do you have time to pull over to go down into that basement and deal with all of that <laughs> energy that's there? Right. And it's, so it's like the 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 the. the um, truck is going and you know we're on a course and that stuff like you know we'll deal with that next year right and so you know and next year you're just hauling more right and you put more in the basement and it's, and it's more challenging and so you know for me I, I like to pull over once or twice a year take about a week and just get into you know emoting and being in that space um, it's not necessarily convenient but it's good work People won't usually start a fear practice until they're in crisis. Right. And, you know, like imagine you've been pumping away on a handcart down one track, your whole life, one train track, and all of a sudden you have a monster wipeout. And all of a sudden it's a huge opportunity. And you look up and you're like, okay, am I going to get back on the same track? Because is it heading where I want it to go? You know, maybe not. And there's so many different options. And so we never want to let a good crisis go to waste. But like the worst thing that can happen to somebody is their life is doing just fine. And it's very rare that people will do what you say, which is, you know, just take a week off to just re kind of reboot and, and look at their shadow unless they're in crisis. Right. Um, I'm jealous of my friends that go through divorces or injuries, right? <laughs> like, oh my gosh, what a good learning opportunity, right? Uh -huh. um, so. But isn't that, isn't that isn't that why most people end up creating drama is because there's so much wound right under the surface that they need to kind of scratch a little just to like allow that healing to happen and it's just it's you know it's not good for the kids it's not good for the world but it's just you know because we don't allow for it it comes out in in crisis which sucks so when you are looking for crisis or when like a smoker's looking for a cigarette, that is fear in the basement that you're not dealing with that is desperately trying to get your attention saying, hey, pay attention to me. Hmm. And so it's really important that you, you know, your relationship with fear is the most important relationship of your life, much more important than your relationship with your wife, children, boss, you know, you name it, parents, because it's the relationship that you have with yourself. Mm. And if you have kind of a block it out, hating, you know, relationship with your, hatred relationship with yourself, then um, it's gonna affect your self-esteem. I mean, um, let's do a little exercise. Sure. Uh, why don't you talk to me like I'm, an individual in your life, you know, an employee, a child, maybe a colleague, a, a spouse, whatever. Um, and I'm your fear. 
like and, and start your sentences with you like okay. what that looks like is like oh you're so annoying right mm -hmm. like you just wake me up in the middle of the night and you won't shut up like what the hell is that all about like just talk to me mm -hmm. and just you know spend like 30 seconds you simply won't let it go will you uh, I do all these things and I you know push harder and harder and then you're just on my on my heels all day every day following me with this thing and you know I every time I want to stiff up her lip um, I realize that you know you kind of step up and you get more kind of naggy at me and so I, I understand we need to slow down we need to deal with this but the show must go on you are um, freaking annoying and you're always there, right? And, and, and so that, that's the one dialogue. The other dialogue is, ooh, you're calling me. <laughs> ooh, you're calling me, right? Um, okay, what is this? I understand you are telling me now that it's time to pull over um, and look at something. So what is this? What, what am I missing here? Um, and and that that dialogue is the the kind of the, the wisdom dialogue that's that's there when you when, when I'm paying attention to it kind of thing. Which most people don't have. They only have the first part, and they right. may go so far as to say, "You are ruining my life." Hmm. And so um, it's great that you have both. But you know, imagine if you talk to your wife that first way, like you're so annoying, hmm. like. You know, you're, you're always around nagging me, like, mm -hmm. especially when I'm trying to work or when I'm trying to do something, you know, to expand who I am, like... You're in my way. Yeah. It's like, what kind of relationship would you mm -hmm. have with her, right? Mm -hmm. And so if, and, and if fear then reacts by having low self-esteem about itself, it's like, oh, I have no right to be here, and you know, it, then it affects... Um, your self-esteem because whatever fear feels from the basement like if fear feels sad or rejected or has a self-esteem problem or feels angry or like resentful and vi seeking vicious revenge you know that's gonna be how you feel that's gonna show up you know in your life um, in some pretty wacky ways mm. uh, that's why I say your relationship with fear is the most important relationship of your life. And so when I offer the solution, it's like, let's try to get this to be the most healthy relationship possible. So what would that look like? Like, how could you treat fear differently? Simply understanding that it's a child of yours, I would say, is the first thing, right? So, you know, do any children deserve to be in the basement? The answer is obviously no. So then it's about reconciliation, you know, what is it, what are you trying to tell me, what, I'm so sorry, what, you know, I understand that you, that you are, you are a big part of me, you are my child, you are part of me, how, how can we start this conversation to make amends, please, tell me what, tell me what you're feeling. Perfect. And that's what we do. And that's how we start to learn how to feel our fear rather than think about it or trying to rationalize it away. And here's an interesting point. If you have a long-term history of putting fear in the basement, you know, especially because the way our parents raise us, like when you first say at age three or whatever, mom, I'm afraid, what does mom typically say? Don't worry, honey. Um, don't worry, honey. Everything's going to be okay. Right. Nurturing. Yeah, there's... Yeah, there's nothing to be afraid of. Right. And that's when the madness begins because you're taught, I call it fear shaming, that, you know, this is just made up. It's not real. Um, it's something to be embarrassed about. We need to push it away. And whatever age you start repressing fear or putting it in the basement, that's the level to which fear has developed as an individual. Like uh. if you repress fear at age three, it's still operating and acting in your life at a three-year-old level. Mm -hmm. Same with anger. You know, if you start like mom says we don't do that you know anger is not allowed you know your anger stops developing at age three and it now comes out in kind of a crazy or Im immature way but if you take fear out of the basement and you make friends with it you know changing your language like you just did around how you deal with fear is one of the most important things you can do to having a healthy relationship with it like I'm okay with fear. I'm not trying to conquer it. I'm not trying to overcome it. I'm trying to feel it. I'm trying to be intimate with it. I'm trying to use it as a, a, a tool and creativity resource to help me come alive, a motivator, all of that. Like invite fear into your life like that as a welcomed, honored part of your life. 
then things change and they change really fast. So let me ask you this, because you deal with normal people out in the real world, is I feel like a lot of people will go to like a, a weekend retreat or a week long, like let's go, you know, kumbaya somewhere and like let out, the, let out the dirty laundry and have an experience around something like this. But I feel like the, the other 99% are like, I, 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 don't, I can't touch that pressure release valve because Medusa is going to come out. Right? And they don't know how to even interface with this type of work without feeling like it's going to destroy their storefront and like derail their life and make it like <laughs> down, downright impossible to function, right? There's that, there's that yeah. fear of like, this, there's just too much down there. I, I, I don't even know where to start. What do you say to someone like that? What I do when I work with people that of course can't come out in the book, um, but I do a pretty good job of addressing it is I'm not, I, what I'm doing right now with you is not what I do. I don't just kind of talk to people about their fear and give them this experience. I'm a facilitator. I don't actually give anybody advice. I just facilitate them um, into uh, coming up with their own realizations because everybody has a completely different relationship with fear. You know, 7.5 billion people on the planet, 7.5 different relationships. And so I will ask to speak to their voice of fear in the basement. And I'll say, how's it going? And fear will speak and say, well, it's not going well. Like, she wants nothing to do with me. You know, she being, in this case, Kristen, right? Um, she's been putting me down here for a while. I'm really upset. I'm, you know, I'm starting to, uh, you know, get really anxious. And, like, I've got to get my message out. I will not be denied, right? I need to get out. And so I'll just work with people and everybody's so different. Like if, even if we take fear 1% out of the basement for somebody and give them, you know, just a little uh, crack at the top of the basement door, you know, some fresh air and some sunshine coming in, that can be just a radically life changing experience for fear and thus for the individual that I'm working with. Um, and sometimes that's all it takes, you know, just even to see that, oh my gosh, duh, I've been repressing fear for the last 30 years and that's why I am so anxious. And it's a dead end road for me to take these deep breaths and use the tapping and meditate in a way and all that, that what I really need to do is do the exact opposite. And instead of trying to find ways to distract myself from it, find ways to turn towards it. And even if you give fear just a little bit of attention or energy, that relationship starts to heal very quickly just like any relationship would like mm. if you say to your child like oh my gosh i've been such a jerk i don't know what i was thinking you know can i make it up to you like can you see that um things change in that relationship and they change fast quickly well, especially with a, a child who has been uh repressed and not getting that for a while one warm hug will will melt a glacier right like it's yes it, oh yeah yeah it, it, doesn't, oh, it doesn't i love take it much. yeah it doesn't take much i love this uh, we're running out of time and i could go on this subject for a long long time the book is called the art of fear by kristen ulmer um very very interesting subject matter you know you've obviously run the miles and, and kind of been there yourself and come back or ski the miles, uh, you know, and, and come back to have a really a sane, sensible approach to this. And I really do feel like you're on to something that is, you know, it's it's happening all the way, reflected up to global politics. Is this repression of who we are? This repression of, you know, our fear is now, you know, turning into global racism. It's turning into an arms race. I mean, it's if you if you take this and it kind of extrapolate how far this has gone into what we're doing and what we're talking about as a society it really uh, can go back down to that basement. And uh, go ahead. One of the ways that uh, repressed fear shows up is blame. Like, like I'm not willing to deal with my fear, so I'm just gonna project it on you until we're like monkeys throwing our poop at each other. Mm. And if, I mean, imagine if we all dealt with our fear, um, how much this world would change. Yeah. Yeah, amen. Well, and, and that's the healing we need to do, right? If you say it's our core relationship, and I tend to agree with you, and your kind of first order relationship that you have to heal, um, you know, there's, I mean, look, there's religious doctrines that are love and fear, and even Star Wars is talking about fear and love and uh, all these things. But it's because it's primal, and it's the most personal thing that we have, and yet we don't, I mean, I didn't learn this in grade school. Right, you didn't learn it while you were jumping off cliffs. You you, you had to come back around to it. <laughs> yeah. 
So I'd like my three-year-old and my 19-month-old to know it now. Right. Oh, yes. The best thing you can do for your child is when they say, I feel afraid, say, well, the world is a scary place now, isn't it? Mm. And nothing more. And, and do we have one minute left? Yeah, yeah, we, we can do it. Go for it. So chaos theory. Um, you know, there's a lot of different versions of this, but here's my version. Like imagine a big chalkboard with a huge mathematical equation on it and at the lower right hand corner equals you. Like this is your makeup in your unconscious world. And I talked about taking fear even 1% out of the basement. And let's say you change a number in this giant mathematical equation making up you from a zero to a one. Like I'm 1% more willing to feel my fear. Can you see that that has a huge effect on who you are as a person? Mm. Even 1% changes everything. Mm. Or you change like, okay, I, I no longer see your fear see fear as a negative, I see it as a positive, so you say changes a negative to a plus sign. I mean it changes everything so dramatically. So chaos theory shows us that small changes result in big changes in who you are and the life that you live. Well, and it's also if you've been um, you know, locked into a hut for a cold wet, rainy winter, and then you get a beautiful sunny day, even five minutes out there is like life transforming, right? I mean, it is not much, it is not much to swing on that, on that hinge to start to feel the breath of fresh air from like, you know, the repression, all the energy that goes into, you know, bolstering oh. this person you need to be to, you know, hide your fear. It's exhausting. I have had clients um, just come through the other side of maybe a lifelong depression in just a few hours from this work. It's really profound. The, the result that this offers you in your life is it's just shocking and it's so obvious and so easy and it, it's so much work to repress fear and it's not, it, it's work to take it out of the basement and, and find a way to invite it into your life in an honored way, but it's a lot easier, a lot easier and the results that you get are profound. Amen. Yeah, and, and this, is, this is true medicine, right? Is digging deep and, mm. and getting into mm -hmm. the core of who we are. Man, yeah. well, I am so happy you turned that corner. I mean, it's, it's cool to watch people jump off cliffs, but that's not reality either, right? Like that's not, you know, that career is exhausting. And so, you know, thankfully you came out of that, you know, with, it looks like your body's intact, right? Like, <laughs> right? Yeah. yeah, right? I'm sure you've had I, I a few I had schools. to. I'm lucky to be alive, actually. Uh, you know, extreme skiing is a very dangerous sport, and a lot of my friends didn't make it out, and uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, well, and, and you're doing some really meaningful work now and transforming lives, thank so you. thank you for that. Uh, again, the book is called The Art of Fear, uh, Kristen Ulmer. Uh, I always want to make sure I get people's last names right. Kristen mm -hmm. Ulmer, available everywhere. Books are available. And um, this is uh, the beginning of a conversation, not the end. Um, I'd like for you to start doing this work and report back, and we'll, we'll get Kristen back on at some point. And let's, let's keep this conversation going to see what fear, uh, the, 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 the looking at fear will unlock in your life and what this will do to transform the, the people in your world and all the people. Like, you know, there's a ripple effect, right? For me to hold on to my fear uh, instills this generational crap into my children as well, right? And so it's my responsibility to make the buck stop here, which means I gotta, I gotta heal, right? And so, and we all have to do that, so. And if you don't have peace with fear, you don't have peace with yourself. And I'll tell you what, global peace is the furthest thing, thing from your mind in a moment like that. Hmm. Hmm. Amen. Kristen, thank you so much. I uh, hope to see you around more often. I love this. We're going to go skiing next year. Let me know what you, yes. <laughs> Let me know what you think. And if you want to see me and Kristen go out there and have me get my ass kicked by her, uh, throw on some GoPros and just go out there and have some fun. No one's jumping off cliffs. We're just going to go have a, go have a fun, <laughs> fun ski day and we'll take it from there. Uh, you'll have to wait till next season. I will see you next time.